All right, hey everybody, back for another video. Uh, my name's Cameron, I'm here with Casey. Yo. And uh, we're gonna be doing a steelhead setup video. So we're gonna go over literally everything you need for steelhead fishing. And uh, yeah, so we'll get into it. Okay, so first thing you need before we even talk about, you know, our rod, reels, and setup is uh, you need a steelhead conservation stamp. So when you go and purchase your freshwater license and you see that there will be a list of um, conservation stamps you can buy from, so whether it be your salmon stamp or your steelhead stamp or a classified water stamp, uh, in all of British Columbia you will need a steelhead conservation stamp. That will allow you to fish for keep and them. keep and catch and release uh, wild steelhead. Anyway, so you guys, we're going to go over our setups here. Specifically the uh, the rod first. So right here I have the old Shimano Convergence. This is like my first ever salmon bait casting rod. It's a uh, it's a medium medium power uh, and the line weight's 12 to 20 pound. Length is 10.6. Yeah, I think with that slow action, it kind of absorbs the little shakes from the steelhead when they come and when they come up to the surface and they shake their head right and uh, kind of keeps the fish on a bit better than a lot stiffer of a rod. Um, and obviously it has that lighter action to where you enjoy the fight. It's not like a big like meat <laughs> stick where you're just pulling the fish in like a, like a Chinook or something. You enjoy the fish. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my bait casting setup. Yeah. Okay. Casey, yeah. you can go over your stuff. Yeah, so here um, I've got uh, my trusty old G Loomis GL3, it's a 10 and a half foot medium rated 6 to 12. Uh, I love this rod, it's super light in hand. It's got a very sensitive quick tip. Uh, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's got a very thick butt section. So this thing, I, you can get corked pretty good. It's got some backbone. It, it's got backbone. So this is a great rod if you, you know, if you want to fight fish in a Tamahai area where you're fishing you know, rapids type of stuff yeah. and you need to keep fish in close, it's a great rod for that. Um, and since it's also a little stiffer, even when you're making those long drifts, you know, those 80 foot, 90 foot drifts down the river on the far seam and the float drains, you don't have that much noodle in it. So when you go set that hook, you're really setting the oh, hook yeah, properly. Oh yeah, you're setting it into that fish. Yeah. Uh, so the reel I've got here, uh, so I trust the old Johnny Moore's Carbon Light 2.0. Uh, it, it actually lost the handle during salmon season. The screw fell out and then the handle slipped off. But uh, again, low profile style, I'd say it's around like a size 200, which is like perfect for a steelhead. Um, but I mean, a note basically you can take uh, from, you know, what Cameron's setup is and mine setup is. Uh, we prefer, you know, something a little smaller, a little bit more finesse. Yeah. But at the same time, these reels do have a phenomenal drag system. So yeah, well, back to Cameron here. For your reels, well, minus one. And then... Anyways, the reel I'm using is the uh, the Trex 300. Man, I've had this reel for three years, and it's the the top of it's a bit scuffed up, but other than that, the I haven't really had any problems with it. No. It casts like a dream, rarely ever backlashes. Uh, like you can just feel the quality in your hands, right? And also, I I believe it's a polymer body, so when you're using it in these like colder like minus 10 conditions your fingers don't get as cold as they would if you're using like a full metal reel or for example like a center pin yeah. um, so which is obviously nice because you're not freezing the whole time um, and yeah great casting reel and they last and they have a sealed drag system so you can use these in the salt yeah. if you want. The so, drag is pretty phenomenal yeah. across the trench like you can you can catch yeah. Chinooks everything with yeah. it. Yeah like that's why like they charge, they charge their, they charge high prices for the tranks, but yeah. until you actually get your hands on one and use one, that's when you realize, wow, it's actually worth, yeah, it's worth the money they charge you for. So, definitely a, a high quality reel for the guys that are really abusive on their stuff and you know are out there, you know, for like two thirds of the winter season oh, yeah. and you know you're you're being mean to your stuff. Like definitely a reel to look at. Yeah, durability is there for sure. Mm -hmm. Also, the low profile reels. Yeah, the low pro's nice. Low pro's nice. It fits in your hand well. You can see, like, my hands, like, it just fits with the hand, and when you hold the rod, your thumb just fits perfectly in the in the gap there. Like, 
low profiles compared to like the old like Calcuttas. Oh yeah, they're the, pretty beefy. The big, the big old yeah. school. Well, yeah. More. These are definitely more finesse. Yeah. So don't get us wrong. Like the those, you know, I I know a couple like older anglers that they use those older reels and they catch fish. Don't get like those things are great, but you know yeah. your real choice will really just come down to how much you use it, how rough are you. And, and your preference. So yeah. like for us younger guys, we like the lighter, you know, more finesse stuff. Yeah, yeah it's going to cost you a couple more bucks, but you know, that's the price you got to pay when it's, it's something like bass you enjoy. Fishing, man. Yeah, it's like fast fishing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, another thing you guys I forgot to add was uh, the fact that these newer low profile reels have like super high reel in ratios. So mine's like a seven, seven point six. Yeah. Like, Per, like rotation of the handle yeah. so the spool spins seven times every time the uh, the handle reels around once yeah. so and I'm sure Casey's is like a six to one or something or yeah it's like six six quick. it's six four so definitely great for you know you have to make that long make the long cast long drift when that float drains you quickly reel you reel like yeah. three four times you're tight to it and you just jam that fish oh, oh, another point was like for example when you really want to cover water like I definitely recommend a lower profile reel just because when you're when you're center pin fishing, you can cast, right? You're casting and then when you reel in it takes forever to reel in. Yeah, it's a one to one ratio. You're, you're just, like, just reeling in and like yeah. you like your buddy's going down who's got the bait cast, he's going down to the next hole already and you're still re you're still reeling in, right? Yeah. So with this low profile reel you can really cover water, I'd say a lot more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, when it when it warms up you can switch to your center pin and um fish is definitely more enjoyable fight I'd say yeah for but sure. the but in terms of covering water and trying to get that first fish of the year uh, I'd say the bait caster is the way to go mm -hmm. but yeah so now we're just we're just gonna talk about uh, center pin fishing and kind of the setup we're using here um, I have two setups here that I use they're both actually Fred's Akuma rods um, the one's a medium heavy and the one's a medium. So this was the rod I actually caught my first steelhead on. Uh, this is a medium heavy 10.6, 15 to 25 pound. Um, this rod has a lot of backbone. I, I'd say this is definitely more for Chinooks. Um, and uh, yeah, anyways, so I've kind of progressed from this rod and this reel, which don't get me wrong, these Islander reels are great. But this is the new setup I'm using now. I have the uh, the John Milner Vetter, and I have here a medium action, eight to fifteen pound rod. So this is this is a lot lighter action, but it still has backbone. So with my bait casting rod, another point I was going to say, and what Casey brought up was, is that his G Loomis rod is backbone, which I think is a big thing for turning fish's head around those logs when you catch them, right? Yeah. Or just body in a fish yeah. when you need to. Or keep them, keep them out of the current because again, like you fish steelhead, you'll yeah. fish the, you know, that inside or the outside seam. Yeah. Last thing you want is for that fish to hit that fast current and just run because once they start running, it's, it's hard to turn them around. Yeah, so with this, you don't have as thick and heavy of a rod, right? And you can't enjoy the fight as much with a medium heavy, I'd say. But with a medium, you can really feel those fish and it absorbs those little head shakes a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So. And with this one, it's even got that length, that 11-3 length, where it helps just that little bit farther of a cast where you can mend your line and get a better, cleaner drift through the run. It gives you more leverage as well when you fight the fish. Yeah, it's more like, leverage. Just for reference, this rod is 9 inches longer than, you know, all our other rods, his other pin and our two casting rods, right? Yeah. So you are getting a lot more when it comes to fighting the fish. You know, yeah. Keeping it controlled and that type of stuff. So Yeah, yeah so then... Anyways, I can I'll, I'll I'll show the specs of the reel on like covering what I'm talking, but anyways, yeah, this is my go-to uh, center pin steelhead setup. Line time. All right. So, what line to use? Um, firstly, for me on my casting rods, I will usually run thirty pound braid. Um, gets the job done across every single like Pacific Northwest anadromous species there is. 
Uh, like this year, I was using 30 pound braid fishing push, like massive Chinooks on the better. Yeah. May not have been the smartest move, but it was definitely really fun. It worked. But for steelhead, I think, you know, either running like 30 pound braid or like a 17 or 15 pound mono is definitely yeah. the way to go type of thing. I, I've even, I'd even go like as far as going 50 pound. Oh, yeah. Because I find 50 actually, when you, like, when you cast, so say you, say you have what kind of bumper? I've run a 20 pound maximum bumper. Like in terms of like length. Oh, it's about eight, eight to 10 feet. So eight to 10 feet. So you have like eight to 10 foot bumper, right? Yeah. So then when you make that cast, so you make a 30 foot cast, the other like 20 or whatever feet or so are the 50 pound uh, braid, right? And what I found with the 50 pound is that it'll actually, it floats a lot better on the water. That is than true. 30. That is so true. So you get yeah. those nice, like you get a nicer mend. Yeah. It's, makes it's, sense. It picks up really well. The heavier, heavier braid is much nicer to mend and stuff like that. But you know, it does have its trade offs running heavy braid. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. you know, it kind of goes both ways. Your line preference is, it, it's really up to the angler itself. Yeah. Also depends on the water you're fishing. Yeah. If you're going to fish, you know, a super long run, mm -hmm. then running braid, to a bumper section is nice because your braid will float off the water and since it's super stiff when you go to hook set there's not that much stretch that you find a mono yeah but at the same time if you're going to be like a pocket fisherman you know fishing behind boulders and stuff like that you don't need the long distance cast yeah no you can just run save the money yeah just run mono and yeah. that mono actually is much nicer fighting fish because you get all yeah. that stretch and absorbent so yeah. depending on on where you're fishing mainly then that's going to kind of dictate your choice but um just like two two of the go-to kind of like lines that I really love using, it's gonna be thirty pound uh, Power Pro uh, Super Slick V8. So that's their newest stuff. Yeah. It has a really nice wax coating on it. Yeah. So it's super smooth. And when I'm running my mono, probably like seventeen pound suffix um, suffix advanced. Yeah. I think Cam's that's on the pins. Yeah. That's what we're running on the that, pins. Running that stuff on the pins is so nice. Low yeah. memory uh, doesn't doesn't get super brittle in the cold. Those yeah. are probably like to the go-to's. Yeah. For my bumper sections though, I'll just show that real quick. I usually just run, as I said, 8 to 10 feet of 20 pound maxima. I tie like an Alberto knot or if I'm in a real jam of things, I'll just yeah. tie like a double union, just make sure it's seated down real nicely. But that that's probably like the easiest, cheapest yeah. bumper section there's known to demand that works great. Okay, so we got a couple of different floats here. So obviously after, after your main line, you gotta have some sort of flotation device, right? Yeah. We're not we're not just drifting lead down a run with a no. with a steelhead worm. Yeah. <laughs> so we got a bunch of different floats here. As you see, we got some tall and skinny floats, we got cork floats, we've got you know DNEs, this nice and squishy, we've got some hard plastics, and we've got like your you know your OG styrofoam floats. Yeah. So um a lot of people have different, you know, kind of opinions about what type of floats you use in different types of water. Yeah. If you ask me, I'm someone that kind of likes one thing that'll do it all, so I'm not switch, switch, switching up setups, you know, throughout the day. And my go-to float is always going to be a 25 gram DNE. It's not super short and stubby, but it's also not super long. So basically what that's going to allow you to do is if you're fishing something super boily, it won't get caught up as, around as much as one no. of these, as like one of these long plastic clear just but at the same yeah. time it'll also track properly when you're fishing you know your deeper your deeper runs right which is what these these excel at um when it comes to the grams and this is more stubby too so yeah for shallower runs yeah these are also great for you know your tail up runs or your head of runs or you're, you're fishing a shallower inside outside like a riffle. Scene. yeah like a or riffle like exactly a boil yeah. or something a small little boil yeah. uh, when it comes to the gram and the weight of floats it really depends on the water um, for us, we'll run anything from a 20 to a 30, basically, just depending on yeah. what the water conditions are. You know, if it's your ideal, you know, steelhead green, it's a little bit higher than 25 is where I like to be. Yeah. Um, if anything gnarlier than that, then we'll pull out the 30 and pull out some big, big presentations. Yeah. I also, I think, it, I think a big thing is the size of the river. Yeah. So the, the better, size of the river. Like, yeah. like for, like, let's give some examples. So like the Nickelman. For example, it's a slow little Tiny, river. Yeah. You're gonna probably use a 25 or something less. Yeah, you because you don't need. You, there's not that much current moving your bait around. You can run like a 17. <laughs> yeah, you can go super light. Yeah. So once you get up to the vetter, 
I think the a 25 is good. Yeah. And in certain areas, maybe even a 30. If I mean, you see me and Cameron here, we're comparing floats and stuff. Uh, a lot of it's confidence, but when it comes from like actually experiencing a steelhead bite and a float drop, yeah. uh, last season in April, I was on the stamp. I was out with Murphy's, Murphy's Sport Fishing. They're a great group of guys that guide there. Uh, I was with Kevin. He's been doing it for a long time. And all we used were d &E floats. Literally, that's it. Yeah. And we were fishing what they considered to be low water in April. It was late season. We were fishing for, you know, we we're trying to find late fish that hadn't spawned for the, for the brood suck program, right? But I had two float drains and I shit you not, they were not no, you know, trout bite or what do you say? It was like a, you know, coho bite where, like, oh, yeah, they just sunk. Where it wiggles, it was like, yeah. boom, down. So, like, yeah. honestly, like, it's, it's just a confidence thing. You use what you like using mm -hmm. and you kind of stick with it unless otherwise, right? Unless you're in like a, oh, I lost all my gear and that's the only float I have, then yeah, yeah. I'll tie on something else. But, you know, use what you prefer to use, use what you like using. Use what you have confidence in. Yeah, I think I think a lot of what you use in salmon fishing, you can apply to steelhead fishing as well. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So, the setups are basically the same. Yeah. You think about it, right? Yeah. It's just the water you fish is a little different. Yeah. So, so yeah, if, I, if, I'm, if, if you're doing anything with a dead drift, I'd say go with what Casey's talking about. If yeah. you're doing anything side drifting, I'd say you go with a slick float. Yeah. And I also think these have a little less drag on the water because they're slimmer, right? Yeah. They don't have that. They just roll. They, they roll. They just, they just cut yeah. through the water better, mm -hmm. and you just stick stick down to the end of the line. D and E floats are indestructible. These will never break. Yeah. These you <laughs> cast them on a rock. I've broken like probably ten of these in yeah. my life. That's why. That's so, that's kind of the reason why. It's and they're. I this. think they're more expensive than the D and E's. Yeah, for they sure. are. They so are. it's like. I mean, yeah, whatever. They're clear. They look like they're. The fish, you, you, you have this thing where you think the fish can't see them, right? But at a certain point, I think when you have that steelhead green water, I don't think they matter. can see your no, float. It does not matter. If it gets really clear, then... Maybe. Maybe, but... Maybe. <sighs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Cam went actually into great detail on how and why he loves using these floats uh, for your thicker you know, it's a little more stubby floats like these cork floats here and you know, this d &E. I actually love using these when I'm fishing the pocket watery stuff. So yeah. when you're using a bit of a heavier weight you, and you have to get down like now. Like, right behind got, that rock. You gotta get down right away. Yeah. You cannot wait for your lead to slowly get down because that fish might actually just be sitting right behind the rock. You never know. Yeah. Right. So when it's that time where I'm fishing and I wanna get down right away, your short stubbier floats work a lot nicer. Sure, they might not track as nicely as a tall, slim float, but you know the fish that are sitting behind those pockets, you know, like you know, behind boulders, they are resting fish that are usually yeah. quite aggressive. They're not yeah. a fish that's sitting, you know, fifteen feet under the surface, sitting there doing nothing. Like yeah. they're those pocket fish are actively moving, trying to get up to the spawning grounds, and they will, like, usually nine out of ten times, if you throw something behind that boulder and they are there, yeah. your float will drain. Yeah. Um, so these are great if you want to throw a little bit heavier in more turbulent water. I wouldn't say you can fish as deep as, as one of the slick floats, but I'd say your, your depth range should be about like three to eight-ish feet around there. I think, I think you can fish as deep, but the sensitivity is not there. Yeah, For exactly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, not, it's not as, not as much finesse as the slick floats. Yeah. You can... Okay guys, so now we'll talk about lead. So there's a lot of different leads you can use and methods of using that lead. Yeah. Um, well, Casey, you want, do you want to go over yours first? Yeah, so my kind of go-tos are split shots, egg sinkers, and pencil lead. In, in, that, in that order. Uh, just because split shot and egg sinkers, they have a fixed weight to them in their yeah. sizes. So you, can, you know exactly how many of those you need to balance out my you know 25 20 or 30 gram float the pencil lead i i have it ranked as you know my number third on that list just because uh eventually when you use so much pencil lead you know almost exactly how much you need to cut off yeah right? that's true. and then you'll eventually just have it like dialed in muscle memory type of thing but that takes a lot of time and a lot of pencil lead so you know if you're a little newer to it or this is like your first season out and you really want to be on top of being on top of uh, be on top of things and have everything dialed in Definitely go with something with fixed numbers. It makes it way easier to balance yeah. out your float and make sure it's tracking properly. Uh, don't get me wrong, I know a lot of folks like 
pencil edge is easy. You just cut off a chunk and you know you're good to yeah, go. Or, or at the start of the season, you just do a uh, like a float test. You can do a float test in a jar, in the bucket, you know, in a pool or something. Yeah. That the float test just helps determine and make sure you know if you have enough weight to balance your float properly. Also note that if you let's say you're fishing a jig or something, something weighted, you do want to have slightly lighter lead. Otherwise, if you've got like perfectly balanced and you add that quarter ounce or eight ounce jig, it's going to be too much weight and your float will slide under. Yeah. So. And then once you once you get that initial size, you just cut clones of it. Yeah, exactly. And you, like this, like I just have a whole bunch of stick weights. Yeah. I got there, and I know I know now what the size is for like a twenty five gram float. So I just cut it every time. You just kind of cut a bunch and of them you, off. And then you you're good for the season, right? Exactly. Um. So yeah, Casey talked about the, uh, like a free, like a, or how would you say it? Um, I use, like personally, I use lots of inline weights. That's just one person, yeah. like, that's what like, you, you can see Cam's weight here is not inline at all. Yeah. It's a freely sliding ticker system. Yeah, the ticker, the ticker's a bit different. Yeah. So, what, like, what I'll use for a ticker is obviously the ticker weight. You can get these in like 25 packs. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a carp slider for like a carp weight when you're carp fishing, but you can also use these. These are actually for it's like salmon trolling. The You just stick your line through the black part yeah. and then you just clip on your ticker weight. So the, you know, right? the, the guys that do traditional mooching, um, they use these a lot because you can snap on your ball weight, yeah, your big ball weight stuff like stuff. that. Or if you're a sturgeon fisherman and you use slidos, yeah. to like snap on your wedge weights, same thing. So. It's, yeah, it's the same thing, but you use it for salmon. Exactly. So, so like a lot of a lot of people, they'll use like a tr three way swivel. The three way swivels aren't great. They they, they just that level. So this spin. is what we we'll get to. This is what yeah. we get to. Yeah. So with this with this method, it's free lining, right? And the nice thing about that is I I think it helps increase the sensitivity of the bite. That's just what I think because yeah. when I use these weights, I'm most most of the time side drifting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why I use those, and they're easy to clip in because they already have the the clip there. So you just clip your weight in, easy to go. But I do love the drift you get with it because yeah, it's, it's a but very like, nice drift. I think yeah. we should also talk about the, uh, the the swivel we use. What do you what do you use, Casey? You use a snap swivel yeah. too? Yeah, I use, of so course. Well, Casey Casey uses the same thing as me with his like non side drifting setup. Yeah. But it's basically the weight goes on the line, right? So I have my ticker weight instead of just the egg sinkers or the split shot. After that, you have a bead to protect your knot. Yeah, it just buffers the knot so that when this slides down, it doesn't, it doesn't land directly and fray or damage your knot. Yeah, just a little bead. Um, and then I use a fisherman's knot. I've always used that. What you can use is you can use, do a fisherman's knot, but like an improved one. So you wrap the line through the eye of the, of the swivel twice, and then yeah. you do your... Uh, your fisherman's knot, but a fisherman's knot will be totally fine. Yeah. After that is your snap swivel. We love snap swivels yeah. for steelhead fishing. Anything where you are going to consistently change leaders, we love snap swivels. Yeah. It is way better than having your standard, you know, barrel swivel or your whatever swivel where you're cutting and retying. Yeah. And it's nice to just have a leader board like so pre-tied and we put loops on the end of them using a double surgeons or a perfection loop. If you want, you can also just tie these to a swivel. The key thing is having some form of loop because that's what you will snap in and out of your snap swivel. Yeah. It is a lot more efficient to save a lot of time. All right, so for a leader, I am a firm believer of just running 15 pound fluoro for literally everything. Uh, if you've seen our previous videos, all I use in the fall, 15 pound fluoro. Summer, 15 pound, pound fluoro. fluoro. <laughs> in the winter, 15 pound fluoro. Yeah. Uh, this is Seaguar Salmon Trout Steelhead. They also make a blue label. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's a lot more abrasion resistant. It's actually meant for like big game saltwater fishing. Yeah. But there, there's also the red label. There's a red I've heard a lot that it snaps too easily. Yeah, the red sort of label thing. is like one step down. It's yeah. cheaper, but you know, orange label is where you want to be. Yeah, it's designed for salmon, trout, and steelhead, so this is a good stuff. Um, I run 15 only because I tied like my loops here. These are this is a double surgeon's loop, so it's not as strong as tying straight to a swivel. Yeah. That's why I use 15. Um, when the water does eventually get low, reluctantly I will swap down to like a 12, but that's yeah. rarely. 
So, yeah. why, why do you like the 15 over the over the 12? 15 is just a confidence thing. I use like 15 everything. Like I land like big chinooks on 15. So like, why would I be afraid to catch steelhead on 15, right? Oh, of course, yeah. And like 15, like you know, water's a little dirtier. 15's great. So I'll tell you this. I used to be like Casey, and I use 15 like all the time, right? I definitely think it helps like whatever getting off snags. Yeah, it's definitely a lot stronger, so you can body those fish in. Like for Chinooks, it's like pretty dead game. 15 is good. But, um, but now, all I use now, actually, is 12 or 10 pound. So these two, it's the same brand as Casey. But uh, Seaguar, what is it, or yep. S -S STS. It's, S yeah, it's all fluorocarbon, if I didn't say that already. Yep. But yeah, 12 to, 12 to 10 pound. Um, why do I like it? I think just that less that lesser diameter I think will increase the amount of strikes you get. Mm. I think in that in those low clear water conditions, yeah. so I think lot, for sure a lot more finesse in using like, the twelve and ten. Yeah, like with sure. with Chinooks with Chinook fishing this year, like I found wow. that that it definitely twelve was the way to go. I was like, also surprised you're fishing yeah. twelve. Like you could see the difference between like yeah. how many fish people caught too, yeah. and what they were using, but. Yeah, I think 12 for Chinooks, definitely, like, mm -hmm. it'll, yeah, it's good. But then, the other thing is, is that when, when, say we're steelhead fishing, right, and you have a bit higher water, like that steelhead green, you don't need to spend the money on a 12-pound line. Yeah, it's going to fight that fish good, but at the same time, they're not, like, they're not going to see the difference between a 12 and 15-pound line. Mm -hmm. So might as well have that strength. Yeah. And I'd honestly even go to a monofilament oh, when yeah. it comes to that's, when it comes to yeah. uh, high water, like that green water, because you're not spending the money on the fluoro. Yeah. The best, uh, best leader material that, that we love, Maximal Ultra Green. Yeah. Get those small little spools. I I had one like these guys here. They're like four or five bucks basically, and you get a hundred feet of it. It's good stuff. Um, it's phenomenal. There's a lot of stretch. Like, it's abrasion resistance, you can beat it up, and you beat the shit out of it, yeah. doesn't matter, you know. It, it holds up really well. So, yeah, like, Cameron brought up a really good point. When the water does come up and get dirty, you don't need fluoro anymore. The fish won't even see your line, really. No. Right? So, running mono is actually great. You get better play actually fighting fish because it yeah. stretches a yeah. lot more. Yeah. Like, trust me, I would use 15, or I would use mono all the time. But in those low water conditions, you gotta yeah. go with something a little 12, lighter. 12, 10. 12, and even yeah. 10, like, I, you know what, this year, I'm, I have, so last year, I fished only 12, okay? Mm -hmm. My dad doesn't even fish 12, because he used that red label stuff, and he was breaking off, <laughs> like, three steel in one day or something, he told me. So, I'm, I've been using 12 ever, like, ever since now, but this year, I'm gonna be trying out 10, because I was salmon fishing with it, and I was pulling in springs with 10 and even like coho or any any species, yep. chums. Um, so I'm gonna be trying it out. Hopefully I don't break off too many fish, but um, yeah. yeah, we'll test it out. Uh, part of it also is the reel, uh, what, what reels you're using actually. I feel like if you're using a center pin where it's just your hand as a drag system, you can I think run, a 10 is good. You can definitely, that, that's you, the other thing. You can run lighter point. because it's yeah. your hand acting as a drag system where you can, yes. you can alter your drag all the time. But yes. if you're using something with a fixed drag with like, you know, like a star drag to someone, whether it be like your casting reels or like a spinning reel where you're cranking down on it, yeah. definitely nice to go a little heavier just because the fish isn't fighting your hand, it's fighting the reel. Right. Yeah. So it's a good point. Yeah. That's I forgot to say that because I do use ten for the center pin. Yeah. Cause I, I use twelve right. for my. For if my you guys caster. watched Cameron's video where he landed that twenty-eight pound spring, uh, the one I tailed from up top at the uh, right above the slab, that yeah. that green goblin of the that thing was yeah, huge. Yeah, big one. He yeah. landed that on twelve pound fluoro, but that was when he was using his pin. Yeah. Like if you were using a casting rod, you definitely would have popped it when that thing. Oh, hundred percent. Hundred percent. So. Yeah. You know, again, depending on also what reel you use can also uh, affect the poundage of liter material you use yeah. as well. So. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, we went over mono and fluoro, but that's yeah. the big ones. And then now is the fun part. Uh, the business end. Yeah. You guys sound great. Collie blades actually don't use that much. Okay, so now, now we're going to talk about the business end. Yeah. So the hook and anything near the hook. Everything kind of on the hook, yeah. Um, and the leader, I, the leader does change compared to what you use. So what we're gonna kinda cover are beads, worms, jigs, 
uh, Colorado blades, and bead. then bait. Um, so Casey, you want to talk about beads? At the yeah. Start? So beads uh, here. We've got yeah. I've actually got pre-tied here. We've got a bunch of different beads. You can see different sizes, different colors. You know, some are just straight colors. Some have like a blend of colors. So you know, depending on the water clarity, the conditions, and how late or early it is in the season, yeah, is going to affect your size of bead. Yeah. For me, when it's a little earlier in the system, where earlier in the season, sorry, where the fish are fresh, you know, straight from, straight from the ocean, or in this case, straight from the freezer, I like to use something a little bit bigger, a uh, little brighter. So, you know, your bright pinks, your cerises, like this uh, modeled cerise, this is a 16 mil from Clear Drift, or like a 14 mil pink and white, this is a trout hard bead. Those, <laughs> those, those are like kind of my go-tos. And then when the water drops and the, it gets a little later, then I pull up my more tangerines, my peaches, stuff that's a little less intrusive, Yeah. right, and a little smaller as well. Uh, leader length for these. This one, actually, this one, I call my first oh, yeah. steelhead on. This guy here is pretty. It's, called, it's but... pretty funky. I don't know what's called either, yeah. but it, it's actually a red bead. And it's actually got hints of blue modeled on the outside. Yeah. It's, it's real funky. It's nice though. Works. But anyway, so leader length um, again depends on the water. Yeah. Uh, depends really late season, early season, low water, high water. Yeah. Um, in in an ideal condition, you know, where it's just steelhead green, I like. 16 to 18 inches is kind of my go-to yeah. with beads. Um, with beads, I also won't really fish the pocket water stuff. I like fishing bigger stuff in pocket water, like worms. Yeah. Just because it's a, it's a dry fly, right? They see it once or twice, that's it. Beads, yeah. I, they're a little smaller, so it's a little... One, one thing to add about leader length, I think also the water you fish really oh, yeah. affects what leader length you use. If you're going to fish beads in pocket water, Short, now I'm like short leaders, 14, 100%. Like, even like 12 if you really yeah, want to, I'd run a short. like a 12 to a 16 inch leader. Just think about it, that yeah. that fish can't necessarily see your bait, like maybe it it's can like, see, like a glimpse of it. Maybe it can see like a foot and a half in front of it. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. that's maybe the, your leader length, right? So it sees your, it sees your weight, it's like, oh, rock, and then it sees your bright colored presentation, and it's like, boom, goes yeah, right exactly. for that, right? And the, yeah, if you're fishing like a longer run that's a little slower, then yeah, you can lengthen up a little yeah. bit, because your weight of your hook will actually help pull your bead down. Yeah. keep it down there but yeah so anywhere from like a you know pocket water 12 to 16 or if you're fishing like a longer run like a 16 to 18 kind of my go-to if it's actually low water like what we're going through right now because it's so damn cold and we're getting I use like, like a two foot a lot of snow that's then, what I use. yeah no like i i'm literally running like a 20 inch liter yeah. with with beads right now i uh, also forgot to say my hooks i use i see i got actually you could probably tell i have a lot of different hooks here um i think right now my go-to hook right for now beads. for beads is actually a uh, owner cutting point size two super sharp super sticky uh and it's got a really aggressive off offset shank in it so like yeah. when you stick fish it, you barely lose them uh so def they cost a bit more than gammies but it's a no very noticeable difference so. i think yeah for me i think size fours yeah for uh, beads yeah I think I think it also depends really on the size, size of bead you use. Yeah. What would you say? What would you I say? Think I think for me, kind of ten. If I use a if, use a four? if I'm using like a, a tiny like an eight, maybe a ten. Yeah. I'd use four. yeah about a four. Yeah. Everything from like a ten to like a fourteen. I'd use a like two. A, a two, and then yeah. like if I'm pulling like sixteens, then one. And then row it kind of changes, but we'll, we'll get yeah there. row bait. We'll get to that because. Depends on size of bait. Yeah. Uh, for worms, worms actually there's a lot. There's different ways you can rig worms. So I'll just show you my worm leaderboard real quick. So as you see, I've actually rigged them all upside down, so the tail kind of kicks in the current, like so. I have a bead underneath as a stopper. Uh, you can rig them this way. You can rig them the standard way. I think Cameron Cameron's got one. There's a six inch. That's a six inch, but he's rigged it this the normal one's... way with the tail down. Uh, you could run that as well for like this is like a high dirty water day type worm. Yeah, and what and what and actually I'll add something. Yeah. This one, so I don't know if you can see it here, but it's just a little little technique. Very oh, smart. There's a little you're piece smart. of line that's kind of skipped that part of the worm. Helps it. And it actually spins in the water. Yeah. So at the end of the drift, when it's you spinning. when you put tension on the rod, it'll your your worm will spin around and your worm will start spinning, kind of like a lure or something, but it's down in the strike zone. So that's just another little effect I got in the worm, but. And then the last, the last technique actually for rigging up worms. We don't do it too much here because our water just doesn't. We'll put a picture up. Does, put a picture it doesn't up. really permit it, but actually 
rigging up worms on jig heads. It's something really common. I don't. I haven't done any of that. If I'm being honest. Yeah, no. It's it's a big Washington, Oregon thing because yeah. they they fish super. They fish canyon systems where it's like super, like deep basically. It's not very wide. It's very long. So, but yeah. that that's kind of like the third way. I I don't use it too much here. For steelhead, but that is that is another method you could use for rigging up your worms. Um, my go-to kind of worms here. See, I got standard your standard pink. You can never go wrong with old school pink. No, that, that the Gibbs the Gibbs Delta four inch pink worm. I love yeah. it. Um, I've got a Captain America. This is I cut Cotton this down. Candy, that's a good one. Yeah, you know the Mad River calls it Captain America. I cut it down yeah. to three inches. Um, I've got pink with a chartreuse tail. I've got a nightmare, and then this is this is one I can't believe I'm showing these guys this one. I'll be honest. Yeah. This one is is pretty dirty. My this is probably like my favorite low water worm. Chartreuse bead with a with a cut down to about yeah. two and a half three inches black uh, green butt skunk is what you know they call what it. Will be a good bead on there. Yeah. Is that white one? That white oh, yeah. translucent. That white hard translucent bead? hard bead that you got. Yeah. So Actually, right there. That yeah. one. Yeah, that's so that's one. another night. These are just my worms. I haven't used these in a whole season, but kind of similar to, to Casey's colors. I think if, if you got like, in the, we'll kind of use these worms in mainly higher water other than the black, other than the black and maybe the nightmare. Oh, actually, wait, I got one more actually rigged up here. This is, this yeah. one's also great low water. Oh, that's a nice one. This one here, it's Mad Rivers. I think I, they call it Brain Freeze or some, something along the lines of that. That's sweet. Nope. They, they call it Ice Blue Pink or... Ice blue, yeah, ice blue pink. Uh, it's a really non-intrusive color, so this is like great when the water's low. There's not too much profile on it, I want to say, because it's very, very like low key. Yeah. But I was ripping this through yesterday with Cam in like negative fourteen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we didn't no float downs, but like no I had two suspect, two suspect fins I did around. And I find that the worms will definitely catch the bigger fish. The, oh, big, yeah. the biggest fish I've caught was on a worm. Yeah. Okay. That that just puts it like, and the the more the 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 bigger of the fish I've caught have been on worms. Oh yeah. So I don't know if it's just the bigger presentation, um, but I don't know. Worms seem to catch bigger fish. Yeah, that's really that's like. yeah it makes sense actually. Like if you follow social media, uh, you follow you follow along some like the guys that fish out Chilakwe a lot. Um, you know, most of the time they actually leave the hook in the mouth of the fish they landed in. You see that. Some of the smaller fish that are usually does eat yeah. the beads, yeah. and you'll get the big gnarly bucks. Sometimes yeah. even the colored up bucks, in like March, April, yeah, the big on bucks, like man. a four or five inch pink worm. Yeah, right. So I don't know. Like I don't know if there's any like correlation between that, yeah. but like you, maybe the saying is true: big bait for big fish. Right. That that makes me so. think about those jig heads again. Yeah. Because think about this: you got this worm, right? That's then, pretty neutrally buoyant. Yeah. And then you so got when you got head. it down there, that jig head keeps that jig right near right, the bottom right where those fish, where those yeah. big bucks are sitting, right? Yeah. So after worms, we have jigs. I can tell. Yeah. So this guy here, this is like an eighth ounce uh, float fishing jig. It's almost what I would call a tequila sunrise, not quite. It's very close, but that's something I would float. Um, we've got, you know, pink and purples. Yeah. This guy's here is a bit bigger. This is a quarter ounce. Uh, we've got some darker, you know, for the lower days. We're not we're not stocked up on jigs, but we're just Black showing and purples, you guys yeah. some colors. You know, and and we've also got a couple of cool ones like Canton. It's it's a little more buggery. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not flowy as much. A little smaller presentation, but yeah. Casey, I think we should talk about how they That's how to say. fish them. because I think it's a lot different. Yeah. You can talk about that. So when we float fish jigs, um, I like fishing jigs in longer, deeper runs, just because again they are weighted. They're not that great for pocket fishing, you know, uneven water, because obviously since it's weighted, you know, if you hit a shallow point, you snag a bottom. Yeah. Uh, so longer runs, deeper runs. Um, the water speed, it could be anywhere from like slow to actually pretty quick, because they stay down there. Yeah. But the key feature is a long, deep run. That's what you want. Uh, the jigs are nice, because in those long, deep runs, they stay down there. Yeah. Right, because they're weighted. If you fish a bead or a worm, worm in a longer run. Boils. I'd say boils. Oh yeah, and even even boils as well. Boils for jigs. Because those fish will sit down in that boil. Yeah. Like, it might be hard for you to fish, but, but on the bottom, there could be a fish sitting down in that boil. But, um, again, like, so for the long deep runs, I'm not a big fan of worms and beads, because since they're buoyant, they actually float up above your yeah, lead. Yeah. And when a fish bites, actually, you won't notice, because yeah. your bait's up below your lead. 
Yeah. Right. And the cool thing about these are, if you want, you can tip them. Bait. Yeah. You want to throw, you know, row on there. You want to, I should, yeah. I wouldn't say row, unless it's like super cured up row. You know, throw on like a piece of shrimp, prawn, stuff like that. Or a worm. Yeah, like hell yeah, if you want. Yeah. If you want, you can even do tie jigs with actual with steelhead worms on them if you yeah. want to, right? You can. So there's a lot of different things you do with jigs. They're quite versatile, even though they are limited to very specific types of water. Yeah. So uh, when it does come to actually fishing them, I will purposely fish super deep, find yeah. bottom, and then I try and get myself about six inches off bottom to a foot. Yeah. That's that's how you want to fish jigs. Uh, you fish it any shallower, the, Def, fish, yeah. the fish won't come up to grab them. You fish no. it deeper, you're snagging You don't fish it the same as beads. In my opinion, no. you don't fish it the same no, as you, Like my ticker, my ticker setup, no, I don't no, fish no. that the same as a Not jig, at all. for sure. No. Or, else I'd, or else I'd lose every jig in my whole Exactly, yeah. Box. like Beads and worms are supposed to tumble. That's a, that's a nice jig. Yeah, beads and worms are supposed to tumble along the bottom. Uh, jigs, no, you don't want them tumbling along the bottom. Yeah. Uh, for colors, there's a lot of different things you do, like nightmares, so yeah. like your black and reds. You can do straight pinks. You can do yeah. one that actually I like to. Tie. We'll show we'll show some colors yeah. and I'll, I'll put it up. There's one that I like to tie. It's called I call it the Canuck. Uh, it's just blue and blue and chartreuse. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. It's it's a bright chartreuse underbody with a dark, dark blue wrap yeah. over top of marabou. Uh, you can do. Yeah. I also think actually I saw this on uh, a bent rod. Shout out to Ben Rod. Yeah. But uh, he was talking about chartreuse kind of later in the season. Yeah. And how the fish will just bite uh, shark. So last year I actually tried that out. And my dad caught one on a shark jig to kind of prove that because we were we were thinking about it. And we were like, man, yeah, this is are these rod. fish really this love them. This is a bent rod jig. This yeah. is a bent rod too. Yeah, you can tell. You just hold it the hook. Like, yeah. But uh, but yeah, so shark definitely works in kind of the later season. I'd say what. Uh, I'd say like March, April, May when yeah. the. The fish, they've all spawned, they're all, they've are all got their spawning colors and yeah. now they're just waiting to get back out to the ocean. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, pink and nightmare kind of colors for the winter. The red, yeah, red, uh, yeah, black, I mean, all that. I guess yeah. nightmare, pink, exactly. and white, and that, that, that sort of the color. Yeah. Um, and then when you kind of get later in the season, I definitely go to something more like vibrant. So like a, like a, like a, green like chartreuse mm -hmm. or the oranges the yellows yep. more like stand out in the water right i mean purple also work too but, like like my dad so I'll, I'll give you guys some uh reference here so my dad's actually caught more steelhead um on jigs than i have but the the one jig i've caught the only the only the only steelhead i've ever caught in a jig was on a naturally colored jig like a like, like a net. It was kind of like it was kind of like this guy, like a bug type yeah, jig, buggery. but all yeah. natural. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know what it was. That low clear water and it was a big. It was a deep run and it went right back in the boil, and the float just went under. Um, and it was on one of those. I have a video. It's up on my channel. But um, uh, what else? So yeah. So and then my dad's fished a lot of like dirty water and he loves fishing jigs and dirty like they, they give a good kind of more dirty yeah. water and like or that steelhead green same sort of thing and he's caught like he's caught steelhead on like rainbow jigs like something even as wild as this yeah, he's caught steelhead on pink, yeah. so I think when it's like that steelhead green you can kind like, of get, yeah pinks go throw, too you can throw a lot of stuff man you can throw a lot but uh but yeah just as a basis for jigs okay collie blades um okay so move on to Colorado blades so. I don't fish Colorado blades too much, like not for steel at least. Like I'll fish Colorado blades yeah. for like pinks and chum all the I damn time. I caught one on, on a Colorado blade. It's just I think the I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to find the right water. The right. I was you gonna need, say the right you water. You need deep and fast because you need enough speed where it'll spin your blade, right? Yeah. And, and you need and you need somewhere deep. It, I think Colorado blades they do work. I know. Yeah. I definitely know guys have caught fish on Colorado blades. They work. I just. I'll show you video after. Yeah. I just. Yeah. It's just finding the water's a little tricky. Like you, I think the ideal seam would be off, like f hard water in the middle, like fast. Yeah. All right on that seam, short, like a fourteen-inch leader. Otherwise, that thing's just gonna come right up. Uh, close to the bottom. I think that's ideal. Uh, I but, think I think I think a Colorado blade is also good for kind of your spay water too, uh, because you can cut. Because like in my opinion, you can cover what like so. The way I fish a Colorado blade, just so you guys know, is I use my ticker setup. Mm. So mm. I can okay, so I see, I when see. I use that slip, float, I see what you're it's talking kind about. of like yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like, it's kind of like that. Yeah. You just kind of let it drift. Yeah. And that blade picks up the lead 
off kind of yeah it kind of swings it swings across up like the that. bottom yeah. and it just swings right in the strike zone yeah so all fish runs kind of more like that. that's that's not a bad idea actually that i think about um, it. but you can also dead drift colorado blades yeah you like, have, like those shavers yeah you oh, yeah, sha oh, them. shavers are different shavers are just yeah. mini, those are like the mini the spoons. little mini spoons yeah no but uh colorado blades the key thing is you have to find something with enough turbulence so your blade spins yeah exactly. and you when you do make your cast you want to be tight to it yeah. you want your blade to actually be behind your float otherwise yeah. it's just spinning the wrong way yeah right so and those fish could hit it and you yeah. don't and you don't you feel won't, it. You won't notice that's it, why yeah. when i i don't i don't necessarily like dead drifting it yeah. i like putting some tension yeah. on it so side drift yeah. it collie was, collie blades they work yeah. they're they're definitely like out of all of like the techniques we're going over like this is we're just talking about like our experiences yeah. and kind of like what i think what has worked for i think us blades and jigs are actually probably the hardest to fish in the winter yeah for sure yeah, so. yeah. i agree uh for blades as well uh there are so many different colors Stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, from what I've heard, at least, is just your standard colors, like just straight silver, straight golds, actually work the best. Yeah. Like we said earlier, pink works great for steel. It absolutely yeah. does. But when it comes to collie blades, that seems to not be the case. From at least the people I've talked to, they just like running with their straight, straight hundred percent like yeah, colors. Like, yeah, mine was on silver. Yeah. The hammered silver. Yeah, so a hammered silver yeah, blade has some flash to it. Gives it a little texture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah lots natural of in the winter. Yeah. Chartreuse and brighter colors, kind of mm -hmm. in the spring, is what we're getting. And again, to. there's also lots of different sizes for blades. And, yeah. You know, it's pretty straightforward. Bigger the blade, for dirtier the water, vice yeah. versa. Okay, last one, bait. Uh, Cam, yeah, I'll let you I talk. Fish, I fish, I fish bait. This guy is the king of bait. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't bait. like fishing bait because um, it's lazy. Anyways, most of the steel I've caught are actually on row row bags. I know a mm. lot of people, they spawn fish, yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, spawn sacks, row yep. bags, yep. whatever. Um, a lot of people fish uh, shrimp. They oh. like to do cured shrimp. Yeah. Cured That's shrimp. a big thing. Yeah. Um, I fish my spawn bags like a certain way. But, I mean, yeah, cured shrimp, like in a dead drift, like what you use with the, with the pencil weight. Yeah. That's a good way to go. Um, I can make another video on curing. You guys just can just let us know if you want to see you, that. So for your bait, I'll ask you, but, do you like, do you like to really heavily cure a bait where it's like relatively dry or do you like it a little more like juicy and stuff? Oh, I like it, I like it juicy. Juicy? Yeah. 100%. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like juice, like you, you see how I run row in the fall. Yeah, like it's yeah. juicy. Like, so like we've been talking about this, like when you go out with that, with that, like that row with the, like kind of that row water at the bottom. And you and you go on these colder temperatures, like your hands are gonna freeze because that's partly partially water, right? Yeah. So like to get rid of that, you could put borax in there, do whatever. Um, but yeah, when the when the weather kind of heats up, I'll definitely use like the more liquidy bait. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. I I've never caught a steelhead on just straight row. No, never. I've caught them all on just row bags. Oh wow, that's. Well, last year I caught two steelhead uh, in one day. For the Wally Hall, that's what like the the one that I entered the twelve pound uh, female, the twelve pound doe or whatever. But I caught two fish in a tail out, and all I was using, I can't remember. What, I think these are one knot hooks. Let me pull one out here. One knot hook, and then I have three little uh, spacer beads, and then I have a pink corky, and the yarn I just put up there just. Like, I don't know, I just put it there, but really all you need is the corky, the three spacer beads, and the hook. And the spacer beads are just kind of to um, keep a bit of uh, space away from your corky, so it doesn't block you hooking the fish if they bite, if they bite it. But basically how this works is you have your corky, and your corky is lifting your, your bait up, up, up above the bottom. So when I'm side drifting, like you'll notice with beads, say you're side drifting, you can you can snag your beads like on the gravel pretty easily. But with a corky, it tends to stay up. So uh, yeah, when I'm so I use the corky and then I put the row bag just on the end of the hook, and I'll literally just side drift that through the whole run. Um, and yeah, it works well for me because you have that scent and you have that pink, that bright pink, and it just stays right in that strike zone, like a couple inches off the bottom, and that's how I've hooked my fish. Like ironically, actually, that setup with quirky and yarn, it's like, it's it's damn good. Yeah. But but the, but it's I'll like, it's, another thing to add is that this isn't for every kind of water. Like I wouldn't no. fish this in low clear. No. But just, when you get that steelhead green, I think definitely like man bait. Bait with bait with that is bait killer. with it. It's just yeah. 
Yeah, so that corky. Trank, so when you fish it effectively, yeah, corky helps it off, keep it off the bottom. As yeah, well. when you side drift too, your your bait isn't just going past it when you dead drift. No, you're kind of holding it in their face. Yeah, it's just like fly fishing, like how you cover water, like how you yeah. effectively cover water. It's kind of like that, but but yeah, that's just what I use for bait. Um, and then if you're gonna use row, I mean, you can do the same thing uh, instead of a row bag. You can do it with row on the so end of the yeah, hook row, or a right. piece of shrimp, whatever. You can fish that technique. But you can also dead drift it, like with Casey's setup and what he uses. Yep. Um, I think and curing, curing is basically the same as salmon. I do, I, I keep it the same. I think pink, pink cure. Do you ever try like cure. just a natural cure? Like where no, it's just, I've never done that. No, no. But they say I think or I, th what were they saying about salmon like the sulfates? But I think I think I think steelhead would too because they go to the ocean. Mm. So I still keep your salts and everything. Or yeah, in there. something a little salty. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Same, same, pretty much the same for salmon you can use for steelhead. You can catch fish. 